John Kleinschmidt. I'm the director of uh, technology development at Cure International. We're a nonprofit uh, charity that operates uh, in 27 different countries. We treat conditions like hydrocephalus and clubfoot. Um, and personally, I've been working on, in the web app world for about 16 years. Uh, love doing things on the cutting edge and love being able to work for an organization that lets me impact uh, the lives of, of children throughout the world. Um, and just a, a little uh, piece of trivia, um, I actually did server-side JavaScript in 97. Um, bonus points if, if you know what that technology actually was. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's fun. OK, so we'll try to keep volume uh, consistent. So let's talk about why offline matters. OK, in the US, we generally have good connectivity, but it's not always the case. Maybe you're at a, a conference in the Wi-Fi site. Here it seems great, but uh, sometimes it's not always the case. Uh, maybe you're at a hospital that limits your data access uh, for different reasons. Or maybe you're somewhere like this. You're at Glacier National Park, which I got a chance to visit recently. And there, the connectivity is uh, practically nothing, which is great for vacation, not so great if you need to work on. Uh, now, globally, connectivity varies a lot more greatly. Um, the reality is where we work as a nonprofit, uh, connectivity is not guaranteed. Uh, a lot of the connectivity is over uh, mobile networks, uh, and so things like power failures happen. Or uh, the other thing is, uh, in Africa, connectivity is probably about 10 years behind where we are. So you might pay like 100 bucks a month for a 256k service. Uh, so, so globally, connectivity is, is an issue. And lastly, um, your servers may not always be a, available. And if they're not available, you are effectively offline. You're, you're eff effectively in, a, in an offline state. But there's also another reason that offline matters to me personally. Uh, one of the conditions we treat at Cure is called hydrocephalus. And hydrocephalus is water on the brain. And as you can see by, by the child, um, the, the baby here, you can see a large head. And, and in fact, some of these heads get really, really big. Um, and it's a deadly condition. Uh, it, if it's not treated, a, a child will die. But fortunately, we've been able to provide care to children with this condition. And, and the, the child you see on the right there, uh, his name is Tom, and he has successfully had surgery um, and is living a, a completely normal life. So we operate this program in about 15 countries uh, throughout Africa and, and Asia. and. Um, we work with local surgeons and with uh, local uh, social workers to, to provide care. But, but we had a problem, and, and that problem was, how do we manage to record the data from these uh, remote locations um, and be able to keep track of the information from all, all the location work that we're doing for quality assurance, but also for research perspectives. So being able to um, do some research to be able to find what's the most effective way of, of treating this condition. So we need a, a solution that is distributed. We need a solution that could work offline. Um, and we needed something that would allow us to, to, to save the dirt data centrally. So I built a HTML5 app um, that allows us to do this. And this app is what I would call an offline first app. So offline first design, what we're looking to do is assume that you are offline. Everything happens in an offline context. Sure, you may have online accessibility, but if you don't, we want to make sure that the app works perfectly uh, with, with, without the online connectivity. Uh, offline first design is also very effective on a mobile app because you don't want your users to experience a different experience when a connection isn't available. So let's, um, we're gonna use this guide here. Someone, some kind soul printed out a, a, a guide for surviving the offline apocalypse. So we're gonna use this as, as a guide. We're gonna look 
and living off the grid in a floor plane shelter. We're going to look at somewhere to store our supplies. We've got to store our stuff somewhere. Uh, we have to have adequate weaponry. We need to make sure that uh, we have all the tools we need to get our work done. And we have to have an escape plan um, if, if we're going to escape the, the offline apocalypse. So let's look at what that means. So the first thing we need is we need to live off the grid. We, we need somewhere, we need a structure, you know, something like this. Uh, this looks like it could be on Tatooine, but it's actually in New Mexico somewhere. But we need somewhere to be able to store our structure. And application cache allows us to do that. Um, so all our JS, our, our, our CSS, anything that we need to render that app offline, we can do with application cache. Now maybe you've heard about application cache. Maybe you've heard that it's kind of a jerk. Um, and it is, but for something like a single page app, it, it actually works pretty well. Okay, so we'll look at a, a brief example here. Uh, you can see at the top here we have a, a manifest attribute in our HTML, and this just points to a manifest file that um, indicates basically what we need to work offline. So in, on the bottom part here we have uh, the declaration of the cache manifest, as well as what's most important is this middle section here where we list um, the files that are required for offline usage. So our CSS, our, our, our images, and, and our JavaScript. And then if, if there are things that we don't need offline, we, we can specify that in our networks section down below. Now, one of the challenges with application cache uh, is that anything that you, the application cache will not be updated unless you update this manifest file. So, um, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is any HTML, any resources served from the application cache, even if you're online, your data, your, your files will be served from the application cache. So one of the things we can do is make our, app, our manifest file dynamic. And you can either do this at build time, so when you're, you're pushing a new build up of your app, you could generate a new manifest file, or in this case, we're just using a simple PHP file that's going to go ahead and uh, basically look at a timestamp on your on your JavaScript file to use that as, as kind of a build number, and then that will allow us to dynamically um, update the, the application cache. Okay, so uh, real briefly, just talk about application cache browser support. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's supported in most browsers, uh, i.e. less than 10. It's not supported in, it's not supported in the upper mini. Um, but pretty pretty good coverage. And if, if you'd like to know more about application cache, uh, Jake Archer has done a, a series of talks and um, articles on this. Uh, so if you just look for application cache as a douchebag, um, you, you can find more of the details. But, but from a time perspective, uh, we, we need to move on. So, okay. Our next rule for uh, surviving the offline apocalypse is to have somewhere to store our stuff. And we're going to use the index DB to do that. And the index DB is a object store. Um, the idea here is that you're using key value pairs to store your data. It's a NoSQL database. Um, its predecessor, WebSQL, was more of like a SQL-ish database. But this allows us to store our data client-side in the browser. Um, and it, it gives us the, the capability of storing the data. Okay, now I'll give you a word of warning about the index DB. It is heavily asynchronous. Now, if you're working with XHR nodes, you're probably not too concerned about that, but it is a consideration in developing your UI. Uh, you need to be aware of it. You, you need to make sure that you're working with it. Okay, so we're going to take a, a, a quick look at an example of using an index DB. So the first thing we're going to do is we need to open the database, which you, you can see at the top here. Uh, and when the database is open, one of the first things that will happen is the version will be checked. So if it's the first time you're opening your database, um, or if you change the version number, so, so if something your schema has changed, you can pass in a new, new database version. 
When that happens, this unupgraded needed event on the bottom fires, and that's where we can then define our database structure. So the database uh, has this concept of object stores, which you can kind of think of that as being like your database tables. And, um, and we, we define what the ID or what the key path, uh, that's the primary identifier for the object store. But then we can also define indexes for the database, and those indexes can either be unique, so that um, for each record, it, uh, for an index, only one record can have that value, or you can have non-unique indexes, uh, which the, the second um, piece of code here is showing. Okay, so as I mentioned before, it's an asynchronous um, API, so we have to wait until the database is open to interact with it. And this is a function that, that might fire after the, the database is open. And everything um, that we're doing, we need to grab a transaction. So that's the first thing we do. And then once we've grabbed a transaction, we can go ahead and actually add data. And one, because it's a NoSQL database, um, you know, you're just interacting with, with JavaScript objects. So, so it's really easy. Um, I don't even have to, in this case, specify what the uh, primary key is, it, it knows that that ID attribute is, is the primary key. Excuse me. So we, we can use that. And then down to the bottom here, we have an example of um, retrieving the data uh, using the identifier that, that the primary identifier we see. And um, I'm going to go through these code examples kind of quickly. I will have my slides available, so um, hopefully that that will be useful in the future. Okay, so as you might guess, one of the things that IndexedDB gives us is indexes. And indexes are useful uh, for searching, particularly when you start having larger data sets. You need a way to be able to efficiently pull that data back. Um, and, and, and there's a couple ways we can do it. So uh, the indexes, index searching kind of works with this idea of uh, key ranges. So you can kind of set like a lower, an upper bound and a lower bound. Um, in this example here, let's say we're looking for all cats whose name starts with C to H. Uh, so, so we can go ahead and query the database, get, get all those records back, um, and, and, and pull the data. The, the second example is, is in this case where you have uh, index values that are not unique. So like, let's say a category. So in this case, I want to pull back all my um, cat pictures that are cat beard pictures, so they're using that, that, that category. Um, so, so we can do that as well. So, so that's kind of some of the flexibility that index DB gives us. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Chrome DevTools gives us a really nice view into index DB, so we can look at all the content, we look at the object stores, uh, we look at the indexes, and, and as you can see here, we we can see keys and uh, and our values, and it's just really useful from a debugging perspective to have this. I'll also mention that um, DevTools has uh, support for application cache and for the file system API, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but that, those are really useful uh, when you're working on that to be able to, to pull in that information. Okay, so index DB browser support. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the major browser supported, uh, the, the really notable one here is that iOS does not support it as, as well as regular Safari, um, but there's a polyfill. And using a polyfill, you, you get coverage on practically every browser. Uh, you miss Opera Mini, um, but it adds support for Safari as well as for Android. Um, no, Android for uh, Chrome for Android is supported natively, but if you if you have to support the old Android browser, the Polyfill will give you that. And that, that Polyfill actually works with the Web SQL API. Okay, so the next thing we're, yeah, I, I, I don't know if anyone recognizes this, but this is actually a Nerf gun that, that, that somebody uh, outfitted, uh, you know, made, made it look a little retro, so it's pretty kick-ass. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, adequate weaponry, and, and so 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 what I want to talk about here is maybe other pieces that would be helpful in having an offline app. 
And in this case, we're talking about the file system API. So what's the file system API useful for? Well, it's useful for storing files. The, the file system API lets you store sandbox files for your app. Um, and in the case of our app, we're using it to store patient photos. So having a, a way of storing that data completely offline. Uh, one of the nice things about it is that you can get um, a, a local URL to that those files. So, so in the case of our app, we want to display an image. I can ask the file system API for for the local URL for that file. So here's here's a code example. Um, and one of the first things we need to do is actually ask for uh, permission to, to to use the file system. And we need to ask for how much storage we need. And one of the concepts here is you have persistent file source as well as temporary file source. So if you only need your files to uh, persist over a, one session, they can be temporary. Otherwise, uh, you can use a persistent file store. So once we've requested uh, access to, to the file system, we can go come and open the file system. And uh, again, this API is asynchronous, uh, so, so you need to, to, to work with this. And um, once we open the file system, we can go ahead, and in this case, what we're doing is we're reading from a file input uh, in the browser. We're grabbing that file, and we're going to save it locally. And as you can see here, we just, from the debug perspective, print out the URL. So that's the local URL of the file. Conversely, we can also get the data out. In, in this example, we're grabbing a file um, and returning it back as a, as a data URI, uh, which could be useful for, for various reasons. And in this case, it uses the file reader API to actually um, convert it into a, a data URI. Uh, and so it, it gives us a, a really flexible way of working with files. It, it, it's hierarchical in nature, so you can actually have like directories, um, and and in our case we use it so each patient gets a its own directory, and then we can kind of organize the files for that patient that way. Okay, so here's the bad news: file system browser support is only in Chrome. However, there is a polyfill for this that uses IndexedDB. So if you're using a browser that uses IndexedDB. Uh, you can use the file system, and if you really want to be adventuresome, you can use the IndexedDB polyfill, and then on top of it, use the file system uh, polyfill. So, 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 it's not useful for everyone. In, in our case, we actually deployed on Google Chromebooks, uh, so we had a specific use case where, where we knew we could target uh, Chrome, and, and I, I actually hope that other browser vendors do bring this to the. Uh, party because I think it's really useful. Okay, so we've, we've talked about you know these different rules of, of, of the offline of surviving the offline apocalypse. The last one we need to talk about is having an escape plan. So it's useful to store data offline, but it's really useful if we can then store it online. So the so the first thing we can do is when we're offline and a, a save happens. We can go ahead and mark that record, just have an attribute that says this needs to be saved in the server. So that's the first piece. The second piece is we need to know when we are online. Um, now, fortunately, there's a there's actually a property in the browser that um, might give us some, some clue as to what's going on here. And that's a navigator online property. And I'll just read a little bit of the description here. It says, it returns true if the user agent might be online. Wait a minute, might be online? Come on, this is the web. We should know whether or not we're online or not. But actually, if you think about it, that, that definition actually makes a lot of sense. Because just because you're online, just because you have a connection to the internet, doesn't mean that where you're trying to go is online. So it gives us a hint of onlineness, or whatever you want to call that. Um, we can use XHR to help us figure out if we're online. We also can use the window online event. So let's take a look at a code example. So here, the first thing we do is we establish a baseline uh, using the navigator online property. We, we can say, okay, you know, baseline seems we're online or offline. 
We can also then tie it into the online and offline events. And you know, if we do encounter an online event, that's a great time to try to save our data online. And then the last piece here is when we do try to save our data, we can again, if, if that request is successful, we can say, well, we're most reasonably online, um, but if it fails, we can say, well, okay, we're offline to the server, at least at this point. Okay, so I'd like to end with um, sharing this picture. And the reason I'm sharing this picture is because these people are survivors of the offline apocalypse. They, they, uh, this group of people has been using uh, this offline app to help record the stories of these patients that, that we've been helping. And so far, 9,000 kids uh, have been entered into the system, and that represents 9,000 lives that have been saved. So not only were we able to use some cool technology to be able to do it, um, but we're actually able to impact lives. So with that, uh, thanks for listening. Thank you.